Always experimenting with the new and the different. In the early 1920s, Sergei Diaghilev was taking a strong interest in the music of the rising prominent members of what was known as Lysis. It was a term that was coined in an article in 1920 by the critic Henri Collet. And in that article he argued the merits of Francis Poulenc, Georges Auric, Germaine Taillefer, Louis Duré, Darius Mio and Arthur Honegger as being ideal representatives of a new school which rejected both the world and influence of Wagner and also the expression and sentiment of Debussy. Smaller, concise and in many ways simpler forms of expression, at least on the surface, were their declared aims, although in fact they never constituted themselves into any kind of a formal group. For the Bally Russe, Diaghilev commissioned three new works by Lysis composers, with Branislava Nijinska as the choreographer for all of them. One was Poulenc's Les Biches, and that premiered at the Salle Garnier in Monte Carlo on January the 6th, 1924. It was inspired by Jean-Antoine Watteau's painting Parc aux Biches, which depicted Louis XIV and various women and which the composer described as a contemporary drawing-room party, suffused with an atmosphere of wantonness, which you sense if you are corrupted, but of which an innocent-minded girl would not be conscious. What a wonderful thought of Diaghilev on the basis of the fairly limited production of Poulenc at that time. I mean, he was 24 when he was commissioned um, to see the genius uh, that this man was, was going to produce. And uh, again, Diaghilev as an animateur, uh, he pairs him up with marie laure And instead of all this baxed brilliance that you're, one's been used to, we have laure with her pale blues and her pinks and her light browns. Uh, everything terribly muted, not back to the opera comique of the 19th century at all, where it's quite, quite new, but on the other hand, uh, it, is, it is very quiet. Uh, and Cocteau refers in one passage to what he calls her ambiguous blend of innocence and corruption, which I think is a marvellous description of the music, too. Uh, again, this is sexy music. You know, it is all about, well, it is about sex, <laughs> but delivered with, uh, with typical Parisian uh, attempt at innocence, and they're pretending to be innocent, but those in the know know that it's not innocent. And it, this is again lifestyle modernism, uh, you know, because they're all dressed in the in, and people in the audience look like the people on stage. So then, in a sense, that uh, that gives the audience a feeling that they are they are up to date, they are à la page.
Another of the three new ballets with Les Six composers that Diaghilev commissioned was Mio's Train Bleu. Jean Cocteau's scenario of sea bathers, tennis players and golf champions all meeting on a beach had décor by the sculptor André Lorrain, a curtain by Pablo Picasso and costumes by Coco Chanel and that directly led to a Coco Chanel fashion vogue for beachwear. And so it went on. There were other remarkable innovations in the Ballet Russe's extraordinary history that we just haven't had space to include in this series of podcasts, such as the kaleidoscopically colourful score that Richard Strauss had written for La Légende de Joseph in 1914, and also the first two highly original ballets that Diaghilev had commissioned from Sergei Prokofiev, Chou, which had premiered in 1921, and Pardassie, which reached the stage in 1927. The third and last Prokofiev commission was also the very last new ballet that Diaghilev brought into the world, and, ironically, Le Fils Prodigue, the prodigal son, ended up in a very atypical ballet russe situation. Atypical because, on this occasion, the composer Prokofiev and the choreographer, Diaghilev's brilliant and acclaimed young find, Georges Balanchine, whom he'd discovered several years earlier, fell out rancorously. And Diaghilev, the master of leading people together, was not able to reconcile them. Ironic particularly because, as Diaghilev's health was now failing fatally, this clash of artists proved to be the finale to the unique 20-year achievement of the inspired impresario who had brought together the most diverse artistic geniuses in the world and synthesised them so uniquely into legendary new collaborations. The Prodigal Son, with a scenario by Boris Kochno, based on the parable in the Gospel of Luke, did go ahead, and it premiered at the Théâtre Serra Bernhardt in Paris on May the 21st, 1929. But the rift between Prokofiev and Balanchine was so acrimonious that the composer completely ignored the choreographer. And all of that with this most evocative of scores. The story of the prodigal son brought forth from Prokofiev a new melodic warmth and mellow orchestral colour in his music. And now this new strand of romanticism in the composer, who had often been so famous for the toughness and harshness in his music, was, as far as Prokofiev himself was concerned, contradicted by the novel detachment of projection that Balanchine expressed in his radical interpretation of the story. The final irony of the fallout between Prokofiev and Balanchine was that Prokofiev truly was writing in a new kind of musical language that was unlike any of his previous compositions. And it was a new direction that he was going to follow up in later works. Yet again, Sergei Diaghilev had been the catalyst for innovation and of a very different kind to before. He did actually say that Diaghilev capitalised on my wish to turn from exterior effects to interior lyricism. How does someone like Diaghilev know that that's what the composer is really after? It's an astonishing way, isn't it, of getting inside somebody else's skin. That's what he was so good at. He knew what you were thinking more, than, more clearly than you did. Unbelievable.
Prokofiev objected to Balanchine's choreography so strongly that he even refused to pay him his due royalties. In earlier times of the Balirus, this kind of situation would have been inconceivable. But by now, Sergei Diaghilev was losing his energy as his life was slipping away. And even that was not the whole story. The strange thing is, we lament the fact that he died in 1929 from uh, his diabetes, which he refused to take seriously. But the fact is, according to many testimonies, that towards the end, he was no longer that interested in the Ballet Russe. He was losing interest. Instead, he became much keener on collecting old Russian books. And that's how he spent much of his energy in the last year of his life. So, in a sense, he knew that he had done his job and could now retire. Three months after the premiere of Le Fils Prodigue, on August the 19th, 1929, Sergei Diaghilev died. In its 20 years, from 1909 to 1929, his ballet russe survived the dramas and traumas of personal furies and political and social earthquakes in a world that was by then completely changed and almost unrecognisable from how it had been when Diaghilev had been born in Imperial Russia on March the 31st, 1872. In those 20 years, he had brought to life an inspired creative environment the likes of which had never existed before, and the likes of which have really never existed since. But the spirit and the example of the Balirus do most certainly continue to exist today, as agelessly as they have done ever since the company performed all those years ago. Their shining light of inspiration and innovation live vibrantly on as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of the birth of the man who said to King Alfonso of Spain, in answer to the king's question, what do you do? Your Majesty, I'm like you. I don't work. I do nothing. But I am indispensable. He was Sergei Diaghilev the creator of the Ballet Russe. It's an incredible period, and uh, what this 20 years, which is nothing 20 years, had as influence on the whole contemporary modernism in the years which came after. And although it was the first war, and then the Russian Revolution, I mean, totally not the right climate to have to explode such an incredible uh, genius and it's like a firework it's just unbelievable what all this gathering could do. Mm -hmm.